Welcome to Smart Talk. On this program, we will speak with leading economists and social scientists from around the world. The conversations are informative and often controversial. Joining us today via Skype is Lord Adair Turner. Lord Turner is the former chairman of the United Kingdom's Financial Services Authority, where he was instrumental in the redesign of the global banking industry. In his new book, Between Debt and the Devil, Lord Turner sets the record straight about what really caused the global economic crisis of 2008. I'm Andrew Mazzoni, president of the Henry George School of Social Science, and this is Smart Talk. Lord Turner, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank okay. you. Well, we're, we have you uh, on our show for a number of reasons. First off, we think you've written the best book on policy in the last 30 years. You've isolated a number of factors that are important. And uh, although it's, it's been talked about, many causes of, of this downturn, your, your isolation of real estate speculation, income inequality, and foreign trade imbalances seem to be the main causes of what is happening. I like to discuss does capitalism have a realization problem, a problem where it systemically can't, can't uh, reproduce itself without constant credit injections? And I think you've, you've answered those questions, and I'd like to debate those and discuss those with you for our, our audience. So without further ado, Lord Turner, uh, the, the real estate speculation, the income inequality issue, uh, why don't you discuss those as the drivers of, uh, of the do current downturn and, and current lack of an upturn? Well, let's uh, focus on the real estate issue first. I mean, the, the fundamental issue is why do we create so much debt uh, in modern economies? And the basic factor is that uh, the fact is that in 1950, uh, private sector debt as a percent of GDP in the advanced economies was 50 percent. And by 2007, that had reached 170 percent. And it increased pretty much every year from 1950 to uh, uh, 2007. And the problem which I describe in my book is if you allow that amount of debt to develop, and in particular, if that debt is against the value of the existing real estate, you can enter an environment where if people then lose confidence in the further growth of real estate values, they feel over leveraged and their attempt to reduce their leverage to get their balance sheets back under control um, drives the economy into a recession and drives an economy into a recession where all our standard public policy levers to get the economy going again are problematic. Now, we can talk more about, you know, what is the problem once we have too much debt. But if I go back to where did the debt come from, one crucial element is that it comes from the role of real estate. And I think what we have to realize is a rising importance of real estate within modern economies is almost inevitable. I think it's inevitable for two reasons. First, because the cost of some non-real estate capital equipment like computers and plant and machinery is actually falling uh, due to the extraordinary power of information and communications technology. And secondly, because the desire to live in a nice part of town or to be able to go to the hotel which is on the beach rather than away from the beach, that is a very naturally arising desire and it makes the competition for nice real estate, the better real estate, a high income elasticity category of activity. It's what you would expect people to spend their money on, some of their money on as people get slowly richer. And one of the big problems is that once people realize that there might be a tendency over time for real estate values to rise because people are competing more and more strongly to own real estate, then we add an extra twist to the process because people say, well, I should treat real estate as an investment class. I should deliberately buy 
even more than I need or I should buy it earlier than I need uh, in order to simply invest for speculative gain. And then there's a further twist, which comes from the fact that real estate is the easiest thing to borrow money against because seen from the banker's point of view, it looks like the easiest form of lending because you don't have to do a complex, difficult analysis of a business proposition, working out whether the entrepreneur who wants to borrow money is any good or not. You just va lend money against the value of the real estate. And as long as the value of the real estate stays the same or goes up, you're fine. If that is the case, the more that people lend and borrow money against real estate, the only thing that can give is the value of real estate. And when that goes up, that then induces in the mind of borrowers and lenders the idea that it would be a good idea to borrow and lend some more money. And so it turns out that these cycles of credit induces real estate, price increases induces more real estate are incredibly powerful in modern economies. They are again and again um, the cause of the biggest problems, because eventually the real estate values get to a level where people no longer have confidence in them. And then the cycle runs into a, down, a, a downward spiral. OK, but that big, kind of begs the question. Uh, if you look at the United States economy from, let's say, 1950 to 1975, there were tremendous growth prospects all through industry and, 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 and that kind of real, real investment, real industry. And there was enough goodness in that so that you didn't have the intense real estate uh, speculation that you had at the tail end of that. It's only when we started outsourcing, for example, America, uh, industry and eliminating purchasing power from the system. And we're having to supp supplement that purchasing power by credit creation that it becomes obvious that if you're going to create credit for consumer loans, or consumer loans, not consumer loans, but loans against real estate, then it's clear that real estate will start to get a bigger share of investment because it's a safer thing than a consumer loan. But the first thing that would trigger that off, because there's been real estate speculation since the beginning of capitalism. Henry George writes about it in the 1870s. I mean, of course, we're, we're Georgia, so neo-Georgia, so we, we're against monopoly in all its forms. We would argue that... Uh, a tax on real estate, of course, would have stopped a lot of this. But this wouldn't have occurred with such intensity if there wasn't a, a, a problem of eliminating income equality. So therefore, the question is, is this eliminatable by public policy? If I'm co correct, the problem gets kicked down the road. The United States faced it and, and triggered off a huge boom that was unsustainable. But let's assume we're all back at equilibrium, and Europe and the United States still have uh, a problem of employing its own people. Therefore, they have an unequal distribution of, of uh, incomes and, and their wealth, which make it impossible to have balanced purchasing power. And, of course, you have the foreign trade imbalances that you pointed out, but that's a function of the unequal uh, incomes. So you have it all together. The question is, how do we break out of this problem with adroit public policy? Well, uh, you're quite right that in addition to the real estate cycle, which has always been with us, right, from the very beginning of, of, of capitalism, and it played a major role, for instance, in the 1920s, a whole load of developments in Florida, uh, which were uh, credit financed, which uh, turned out to be you know, dangerous investments, etc. But something happens from about the mid 1970s or 80s on where the credit growth and the credit growth against real estate intensifies. And I think you are quite right to suggest that particularly in the US, and I think it's more clearly in the US than in other countries, what's going on there is that the another of the three factors is coming to bear, and that is increasing inequality. The fact is that from 1980 through to 30, 2015, the bottom quarter of the American population, uh, real uh, wage earners, have received effectively no real wage increase. They're getting the same real wage as they were getting in 1980, whereas the earnings of the top 1% of the population have gone up about three times. They've had a 200% 
uh, increase. And this, I think, is highly relevant to the way that the economy becomes more credit intensive for two reasons. First, the system may then only balance in demand terms if you have credit, because one of the features of rich people, and particularly people who are getting richer quite rapidly, is that they don't spend all their income. Uh, they save it. They have a high marginal propensity to save. And that means that unless there's an increase in investment demand, and there's no reason to believe that that will occur, uh, that might produce a lack of demand for the economy in the economy, unless, as it were, the savings of the rich are picked up and lent to middle income earners and low income earners. And your low income earners in particular, perceiving that they no longer are participating in the American dream of prosperity increasing with each generation, are, of course, extremely tempted to borrow money to make up for their lack of income progression. And particularly if it seems that house prices are only going to go up and that you can borrow money to buy a house. And even though your income is stagnant, you milk make wealth by the growth of uh, housing value. And I think this is you know, a significant part of the story of what happens with the whole subprime a mortgage boom in the US that faced with the observance of stagnant real wages at the bottom end, increasing inequality, the American political system could not generate an answer to that other than, as Raghu Rajun put it in his fine book, Fault Lines, uh, let them eat credit. And, you know, the, the credit was given to subprime borrowers. And it all seemed to work because we were magically producing wealth out of nowhere, uh, even without real wages uh, increasing, you know, until it didn't work. And then when it didn't work and the prices fell, what, of course, and it was the tragedy is that a group of people who had been tempted into borrowing money against rising house prices lost even the small amount of money that they had to start with. And there's something about inequality can generate a high degree of credit, but it can also generate increased inequality because when you get the downswing, it tends to be the poorest people who actually lose their house and get repossessed, whereas richer people, although they suffer a loss of assets, they're still in the game for, for the next time uh, round. So I think there is, in addition to the real estate story, you are quite right to suggest that there is also this inequality story in why do we get more and more credit? And then the final third one of my factors, if you say, is the global current account imbalance story. All right. So if we take that, we take with the imbalance, the global imbalance, it was clear to, let's say, uh, American corporations that to uh, control labor costs, and Europe probably ha has the same problem, it was simpler to go to a third world country and start manufacturing and import back in. So now you have built up structures in Europe and the United States, you have some high income people who have placed in, in, uh, in technology and finance, and you have a, a significant part of the population that can't participate. How do we break the, how do we change the policy and break this essentially gridlock, which we sit here now in the United States and Europe for years now, slowly paying down the, the debt overhang but no one wants to invest in the real economy at the present time because they don't see any real economy advantage. Well, just to talk about the current account imbalance issue, um, I think there are probably uh, at least two drivers of it and, and, and of uh, inequality. Or there, 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 no, there's a driver of the current account imbalance and then there's another driver of inequality that I want to come back to. I mean, quite clearly what happened from the 1980s and 90s onwards was a, a process of the opening up of China in particular into the global economy. And a, a large workforce entered the global economy and became relevant to the global economy bef well as before it was irrelevant. And although you can have some trade theories that prove that the total level of the global economy that is positive, I think it was undoubtedly a, a, you know, had some negative effect on the wages of, for instance, Americans who were employed in 
uh, uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, manufacturing being the particularly relevant bit because that's the easiest thing to export uh, and import. So that generated large current account surpluses. And the reason why these are part of the story of credit is that if China is deliberately running a large current account surplus and is, as the sort of counterpart of that, accumulating large amounts of U.S. government debt, that must be matched somewhere by the U.S. going into debt because, you know, the, 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 the global economy has to add up. And also the process of them buying U.S. government debt tends to produce very low interest rates in the U.S., which then makes it easy for people in the U.S. to borrow money. So there's clearly this global imbalance comes into the story. It also comes a bit into the story of inequality, though I have to say I would also stress one other thing. And I do think it's important to realize how deep this problem of inequality may be. And it therefore comes to how we're going to deal with it. I think there is also a major technological effect at work. It's true in the long term that technological growth is positive for prosperity. Indeed, in the long term, it's the only thing that produces rising inequality. But economic history tells us that different waves of technological change have different impact on the relative wages of different people with different skills. And I think there's a reasonable inference that we are in the middle of a process whereby information and communications technology is making it so easy to automate away many categories of jobs that it is reducing the equilibrium real wage rate of relatively unskilled people. And by the way, I think this is so deep that even if you dealt with the problems that you're concerned with about the hollowing out of US manufacturing, we would still have this problem. I think it's at least possible that with the progress of robots and automation, that manufacturing may come back to America uh, in the next 10 to 20 years because it's going to be cheaper to manufacture stuff with a robot in America than with a person in China. But it's going to come back with very few jobs. So I think, as it were, even if the jobs to a degree went because of Chinese competition, I think the long term thing could be that they're automated away. And I think what this tells us that there's something about information and communications technology, which simultaneously automates away low paid jobs and also gives enormous returns to companies which can not by cartelized behavior, but by natural processes, end up in dominant monopoly position. I think you're very, very uh, uh, correct on that point. And of course, you're creating first mover monopolies, which weren't badly intended, but nonetheless do exist. And you can almost look at them as another agglomeration of, of real property, real estate. I mean, if you look at the economy as location value in, in major cities, if you look at the technology companies, both pharmaceuticals and Facebook and so forth, where they have either monopoly patent monopoly positions or first mover positions, it's a very small amount of the workforce that controls a very high proportion of the GNP. And there's no mechanism short of government interference in one way or another to equalize or distribute purchasing power. So, so that's, I think, the fundamental problem. And of course, there's ways to break out. And that's one of the reasons why we want to talk to you, have your opinion. Uh, as Georges, we would say, OK, we see a case of monopoly building up here. We would tax that monopoly. We would tax the rents away, probably not tax anything else, and in effect, create a citizen's dividend so that that pool is available to shield against the effects of automation on monopoly. The theory would have to be worked out in, in more complete detail for modern day use. But essentially, the principle is clear, because short of that, how can the government ensure purchasing power for a significant part of the population in the face of the trends, which I think you're absolutely correct on? Well, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's an important insight that the huge returns earned by some of the 
information and communications technology companies are to some degree analogous to the returns used earned on scarce supply urban land in, 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 in economic terms we we see the emergence of of rents R- rents can arise wherever there is a property which is in inherently scarce supply uh, such that the rest of the economy has to pay a rent to it to enjoy the benefit of that you can create essentially a rent if you're clever enough to create a brand which is so strong that everybody wants to pay an enormous amount for that brand, you know, far more than the cost of production. And and that's what, you know, fashion brands uh, effectively do. Uh, But there are these very interesting uh, uh, properties essentially deriving, as you say, from first mover advantage and from this interesting effect of the modern economy called the network externality. Uh, The fact that once you've, you've created a Facebook you know, uh, the more people are in it, the more attractive it is for more people to come in it. Uh, Society has always had these. I mean, if you go back to um, why did the insurance uh, industry in London in the 18th century develop at Mr. Lloyd's coffee shop and at nobody else's coffee shop? Uh, The answer is simply that he had a first mover advantage. So what do we do about it? Um, uh, The answer is I don't have a fully worked out point of view, but I do argue in my book that we cannot simply accept what I call the standard nice liberal, nice rich liberal answer uh, to uh, inequality. Uh, I think there is a tendency for people who are, you know, nice liberals, but nice rich liberals um, to write articles and to make statements of the form. There is a problem of rising inequality. Um, but you wouldn't possibly want to do, deal with that by taxation. And the magic answer, and it's, it's always there at the end of these articles, is skills. I, if, if only we improved everybody's skills, had a better education system, you know, all would be fine. Now, I am as passionate as anybody else about making sure that everybody is educated. I think education has an absolute value separate from its economic value. But I think we're facing something so inherent and deep that even if we manage to get everybody up to a higher level of skill, we might have very significant degrees of inequality. So I do think we are going to have to head towards saying that for our societies to work, we are going to have to have a provision of public goods, by which I mean health and education, but also attractive urban real estate where people live and mass transit systems so that even on relatively low monetary income, you are a participant as a citizen in a society. But I suspect we also have to have ways of supporting the monetary income of people above what they will earn as wage earners. Or you increase minimum wages, and I think you can do that to a degree, though you have to be careful of not putting up the minimum wage to the point where you just get unemployment rather than low wages. Um, Or you need to think about ideas like a citizen's income, a basic income that gets everybody up to what we think of as adequate citizenship within society, even if their economic value in this modern labour market is quite low. And I'm certainly interested in all three of those ideas. But For both of those, whether it's a citizen's income or a tax credit and negative income, if that's what you're doing, you've got to get the revenue from somewhere. All right, Lord Turner, uh, some of the work we've done would would indicate, as a rule of thumb, that if you wanted to know what the land values were in a a capitalist economy, uh, GNP is a good proxy. For example, if if the GNP of the United States was $14 trillion, uh, you can be assured that the land values are close to $14 trillion, plus or minus something. And if you imputed a tax on, on the $14 trillion of, of 10%, let's say a return, the rental return, you could probably cover half the budgets of modern capitalist economies. Uh, the United States, the United States carries a heavy defense component and it carries a heavy welfare component that may not be necessary 
if social benefits were, were adjusted. So you have a powerful uh, taxing mechanism which really would not impinge upon productivity, especially if you allowed income taxes uh, to be el eliminated. And then if you needed to tune up your budgetary process, maybe you could, uh, you could have some sales taxes. But pretty much a land and bad taxes or a real estate land itself and resources covering half, uh, perhaps some sales taxes if, if you need a little extra money, pretty much would do the, do the trick. Okay. Well, I, I'm sympathetic to the theory in favor of taxing rents. And as you know, or as you suggest, uh, uh, throughout economic theory, uh, there is a belief that the good thing about taxing rents is it doesn't change behavior. People don't stop working if you tax rents. It doesn't uh, uh, interfere with the allocation of capital resources, uh, etc. And that, of course, is the great Henry George himself uh, insight in his land value tax. I guess I'd probably step short of the radicalism of believing that you can rely as much as you believe on uh, the land tax, because what would worry me is that if you introduced it at the level you suggest of 10 percent on the land value today, I suspect that you might have a fall in the land value, uh, which, you know, itself would then reduce your tax base. Because in a sense, I think, well, let me let me try. I think the land values today have been somewhat swollen precisely by the fact that there is no tax on them. So somewhere there would be a new equilibrium. And I think that would push me towards saying, yes, there could be an argument for a land tax. And by the way, if there's to be a land tax, it has to be on everything. It has to be on agricultural land, commercial land, development land. And a lot of the problems, I think, in suggesting land taxes is you get all sorts of lobby groups like the agricultural sector who demand that this is nothing to do with them. And, you know, so if you're going to do it, you've got to have it as wide as possible across all land uh, values. I would go for a smaller level than you. I, I don't know what I'd go for, but, uh, you know, I, I'd be wary of, of saying you can get all your money from it. And so I would probably still believe that there will have to be an income tax. I, I don't think we have to reduce income taxes to zero. Well, Lord Turner, I, I wouldn't advocate a sudden jump into this. I'm just saying this is the possible amount of value available. And you're absolutely right. A lot of the rents were, were pulled up by speculation, which would fall back to earth. And therefore, the actual rent commanded by a balanced economy wouldn't be that much, let's say. But that's, uh, that's uh, taking cities like London and, and New York few of the major cities, if they came back to earth, uh, perhaps the land, uh, land rents, and it's not only land rents you can look at, I didn't even count in the rents on the monopoly corporations, the technology corporations that are a result of first movers. I think the, the one thing that interests me, though I can see some difficulties in, I mean, I think you're logically right to say that some of the returns of patent protected pharmaceutical companies, uh, IT companies with dominant positions are of the category of rent. Um, and therefore, theoretically, there's a sympathy for shouldn't they be subject to some taxation on rents. I think the difficulty is in there is to know how precisely you define what is, you know, at least with land, we know what land is and we know it has a rent. When we move into the corporate profit sphere, a, a, a lot of corporations have some element of rent in their profit. Some of them have a hell of a lot of rent in their profit. So, I, you know, I can see some complexities in how you would implement a, you know, we are going to tax rent. OK, without beating this to, to death, we, we can move on. But I would argue on the corporate side, you could just look at a throw off of cash. If there's an immense throw off of cash not being reinvested, if they just took their excess cash flow and reinvested it, but not in, not in scarce resources, not in their own kinds of business that, which are scarce resources, I think there would be no argument about the tax on that, on, on that end of it, in addition to the land. But given that this is a theoretical construct which may be moved toward, toward in the future, but not necessarily now, 
in the short term, how would we break the impasse? What's interesting about the private credit creation process is that before the crisis, the dominant thesis was we can rely on the banking system or the capital market system to create the optimal amount of credit and to allocate it effectively because it's the private market. And I think that was a really quite profound error because I think we have to understand that there is something about finance and in particular credit creation, which is not like the restaurant business or the automobile business or the textile business, where we do pretty much get the best results for society by just leaving it to free competition. There's something about private credit creation, which can A, run out of control and B, allocate it in a non-optimal fashion. And what is very interesting is if we look at the extraordinary success of the Korean or Japanese economies in the 1950s and 60s, they did not get rich by following the precepts of completely free market economies. And in particular, they did not get rich with completely free market approaches to credit allocation. They quite clearly said that it was the role of government and the central bank to have a point of view on where credit was most likely to produce a beneficial effect in terms of the growth of that uh, economy. And they believed at that time that the biggest return to their economies was by fostering export-led manufacturing. Now, you wouldn't necessarily want to follow that pattern you know, entirely today um, because you know, the nature of the economy changes. But it does tell us that we should be very wary of a philosophy that says that you know you can rely on the private credit system to produce a completely optimal result. No, sometimes there's something about this credit creation process where government saying we want more of this than the free market will produce and somewhat less of that is a good idea. It, the key problem that we've got, I think, is that the free market left to itself will gravitate to real estate. Now, I think we need a real estate lending market. I think there's a real estate development process that requires credit. I think there's a mortgage credit process that is required to lubricate the exchange of houses between and within generations. So I'm not saying we don't want any uh, real estate uh, lending, I'm not saying that at all. But I think we have to recognize that we've got a free market system, which if you just leave it to the free market, will end up doing more real estate lending than is optimal for the economy, because it will get into these cycles where it's doing more real estate lending because the price of real estate's gone up, so it does more lending, the price goes up. Uh, and it will do more because this is the easy bit of lending to do, because it doesn't require so much um, credit analysis. So I think we do need, within our financial regulation, not to get the central banks or the regulators required in very specific sector allocation. I don't want the central bank to be saying, oh, you know, the shipbuilding industry ought to get some more credit or the restaurant business. I, I don't think we, we, you know, we want to run a market economy. But I think they need to recognize that the bias of the system is towards real estate and lean the other way. Lean the other way through, for instance, maximum loan to value or loan to income uh, in both uh, real estate and uh, c commercial real estate loans, setting that as regulation. And I think in particular by looking at the capital requirements against real estate lending. So one of the things I think we should do, mm -hmm. in addition to loan to value limits and loan to income limits, is set higher capital weights for lending against real estate than private bankers will ever believe and will ever rightly believe is rational for they themselves to set against real estate. We have to recognize a social externality, uh, a difference between what is good for the social balance versus what makes absolute sense from a private point of view. Now, that makes all the sense of the world to me. Let's go one step further. Uh, we have a situation in Europe and the United States right now of restricted purchasing power. And we've talked about the reasons why that's occurred. And the people with money, the corporations, are really not investing in Europe and the United States because they don't see any real 
returns coming from that. And so it's much easier to sit in the capital markets and trade securities with each other, make commissions uh, and all of that. And uh, as long as that happens, the real economy is left unintended. Uh, what would you do to push bank money into the, into the real economy? Well, I think... I think there are some complexities here which are national specific. You, 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 for instance, in America have some of these huge accumulations of cash which have funny things to do with your taxation regime and the onshore and the offshore money, uh, etc. So there's some specific U.S. Uh, problems in the, tax, in the technicalities of, of the taxation uh, regime. But on the whole... I'm a little bit wary of trying to fix these problems of adequate demand by trying to do it just through the banking system. I think, broadly speaking, stuck in this post-crisis debt overhang with too much debt in the world, we've been trying to get the economy going again by saying we'll do it by very low interest rates or even negative interest rates or quantitative easing, which brings down the long end of the yield curve. I think probably the bigger uh, unmet investment needs exist in the infrastructure space, in which case I don't think you can solve this problem simply by saying, OK, you know, let's get the, let's get, let's sort it out through the banks. Let's you know, let's lower the interest rate or let's change what the banks do. I think you do have to think about a more direct role of the state, you know, either as a direct public investor or as an investor through various categories of public-private partnership. Now, there are some environments in the world where people say, oh, yeah, but you can't do that because the government's already borrowed too much money. And that's where I've made the radical uh, argument, but it is, a, I, I think, an absolutely legitimate argument, that in those circumstances, if you really do think you are constrained from borrowing more money, you can print more money. Now, of course, if you print too much money, and spend it. If the central bank prints too much money, gives to the government and spends it, you will create hyperinflation. So if you're going to do this, you've got to do it in a very constrained amount. But we shouldn't be sitting, you know, at, in, a, in a world of inadequate growth, stuck in a dead overhang trap, saying that we're out of ammunition, that we, that we can't do anything. That makes sense. And that's a, an obvious uh, policy, of course, that will put a lot more of a demand on actual real resources, and of course, exacerbate the environmental issues. But that's we'll kick that down the road. I think your your insight is absolutely uh, on the money. I, I think we've got a wonderful picture here of what you discussed in your book. We don't have all the nuances, of course, but uh, it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful read. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, very much enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. That's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on past and future episodes, log on to our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Andrew Mazzoni. Thanks for joining us.